Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 3. Like we have been doing in the last uh, several weeks, we are going to look at one word this morning and another word this evening. But uh, So we're not going to stay in the book of Acts. We're going to read a verse out of it, and then we're going to go to other places in the Scripture to see what, uh, what God has for us concerning this particular word. In Acts chapter 3 and verse number 25, this is a, a message that Peter is preaching to the Jewish people. And he says, Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the covenant you have made. We know there are many covenants, but Lord, as we look today, I pray that you would help us to see the most important one uh, that we recognize and we understand when you gave Jesus Christ to die in our place. We ask for your guidance, your help as we study your word today. Lord, help us to walk according to what you have for us, what we know you want for our lives. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The word covenant there, it says here, he says that they are, they are children of the prophets and of the covenant. So they are children of the covenant that God made to um, Abraham. And then this is what the covenant is, part of the covenant anyway. At the last sentence of the verse there, after the last uh, comma, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be. Be blessed, and we'll see that in a little bit. But we want to look at the idea and the word covenant. What is a covenant? What is it all about? A covenant is basically a an agreement, but it's a very special agreement. It's not a. Uh, it's not just say, hey, let's do this, and then you go about doing it. It is making promises uh, between people, solemn promises. And most of the time, they are making a covenant before God. If you're if it's between two people or two groups of people uh, but sometimes it's a covenant between God and men and that's the most important covenant what God the promise that God makes uh, toward men or mankind uh, it is not just like I said it's not just a, an agreement not even a contract that's a covenant and when we think about a covenant um, I'm not going to deal with it today but when we talk about a marriage between a man and a woman. Uh, I know that they are, there are people who make contracts today uh, having to do with their marriage. In case we get split up, you have these things and you have these things, that kind of thing is a contract. A marriage before God is more than a contract. Uh, it is a covenant that is never to be broken because it is made before God. When uh, Jesus said, uh, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And, and so when God is part of a covenant, when two people make a covenant, whether it's a marriage covenant or two people agreeing on something, when they do it before God, they are establishing their promise to each other before God. And so God establishes the covenant. And so that covenant is not to be broken. As I said, it's not just not just about marriage, but that is the biggest, that is the most important covenant between a man and a woman, is the promise they make to uh, honor one another, uh, to what the way the marriage vows say, they plight their troth. 
Okay, they promise their faithfulness to one another. And, uh, and that is before God. So the, the Hebrew word, though, as we look at the Old Testament, we're going to start it. We started in the New Testament, but I want to go back to the Old Testament. And we see the word, uh, the first time it's used is in Genesis 6, but we're not going to go there right now. I want to go to Ju Judges chapter 2, because the word is not translated as a covenant. It is translated as a league. We know we, we have uh, baseball league. Uh, what do they call it? The National National League and American League. Why do they call them leagues? Well, they made an agreement. They're with the, each other, I guess, something like that. But a league is an agreement. It is a covenant, biblically. Ju uh, Judges chapter 2. I thought I was going to Joshua, but I won't. But it, this is what it says in jo Judges chapter 2 and verse number 2. God says to the, to the children of Israel, And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye done this? Okay, so he said, This is what I told you. You will not make a league or a covenant between you and any of these people of this land. Uh, go over to Exodus chapter 23. Now this is what he's, he's saying. Here in uh, Judges 2.2, 2, you shall make no league. He's quoting what he said back in Exodus chapter 23. So go to Exodus chapter 23 and look at verse number 31. And God says to the, to the Israelites, And I will set thy bounds from the Red Sea even unto the Sea of the Philistines and from the desert unto the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and thou shalt drive them out before thee. He's talking about the land of Canaan. Okay? He says, Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. Okay? Again, no covenant, no league. Don't make a league with them. Okay, so I, I brought you all of these because we're going to go to the book of Joshua and see what happened to the children of Israel when they got in to the land of Canaan. Joshua chapter 9. I think most of us know what happened, but we want to look at it because there, sometimes we look at this and there's some things we might not understand about it. Okay, but Joshua chapter 9, look at verse number 6. Remember how the Gibeonites came to Joshua and the children of Israel and they made themselves look like they had traveled a long distance because they put on old clothes they put on uh, old shoes and they took with them uh, moldy bread to make it look like they would traveled a long ways now look at what he says verse number six and they went to Joshua unto the camp at Gilgal and said unto him and to the men of Israel we become from a far country now therefore make ye a league with us. Now that's the same word. That's the word covenant. Okay. We we look at this in English, and if we're not, uh, if we don't know what this is in Hebrew. We think they're just making an agreement. Okay. But it's the same word that God said, "Don't make a covenant with them." And the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, that's the Gibeonites, "Peradventure ye dwell among us, and how shall we make a league with you?" Listen, we're not supposed to make a covenant, a league with anybody within this country that God gave to us. How can we do this with you if you, if you live here? Look at verse number 15. They tricked them and said, uh, we're from a far country. They showed them their bread and they showed them their clothes and everything. Look at verse 15. And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live. And the princes of the congregation swear unto them. Now, when you think about that, say they made a league, and they, they, but when, like I said, when we say it in in English, uh, we might not understand how important this uh, agreement was, how solemn the agreement was. It was a covenant that they made with these people before God. That's why later on, if you ever wondered about it, 
when they find out, three days later they find out that they were Gibeonites and they lived right there. But they did not kill them. Why not? Because before God they promised not to. And that's what made it so important for God to say, don't make a covenant with them. Because the covenant is a binding agreement that you must abide by because you are making a promise not only to those people, but you're making a promise to God that you will hold to what you agreed to. That's why they couldn't couldn't do anything about it. If you go on later on, as we continue in the history of the Israelites, and you see that uh, there was a time of famine, and David's wondering, what's going on? What's what, Why are we having this famine? And God made it known to David that his predecessor, Saul, had tried to overcome this agreement, this covenant, by killing the Gibeonites. And God said, no. You, you... He said, this is, this is wrong for you to do. That's why he brought the, the famine. And so David ended up doing what the Gibeonites wanted and taking some of Saul's family and giving them to the Gibeonites for them to kill. That was the, the, the punishment. So God said it was important. You do not break your covenant. So the covenant, there's many covenants in the scripture. And I'm going to look at some, and, and then we're going to look at the very most important one. As we, as we go along. But let's go back to the Old Testament again. Go to Genesis chapter 9. This is what is called the uh, Noahic. Why would you call it Noahic? Well, it's, it has to do with Noah. <laughs> and it is what we, what we see after the flood. Genesis chapter 9. And God uh, makes a covenant not just with Noah, but with Noah's descendants that can... Um, can anybody name uh, uh, one of Noah's descendants? I'll name one before before I. I mean, I know you're all going to say Shem, Ham, or Japh, Ham or Japheth. I'll say Ken Butler. Okay, <laughs> Ken Butler is a descendant of Noah. Okay, so as God makes this promise to Noah and his descendants, it's to all of us. Okay, um, this covenant He makes, Genesis chapter nine, verse number twelve, and God said, "This is the token of the covenant." which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. How long is that going to take? However long God keeps the earth alive and man being born. <clears throat> I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. The rainbow is very important to us. And it is a sad thing that somebody else is using it for their benefit. This is the token. This is what God, when God made the promise, when God made the covenant with Noah and you and me, He says, I do set my bow in the cloud. And you wonder, well, every time the cloud, it says, I bring cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. Did you know that every time the, there's a cloud, there's a, a rainbow in it? You might not see it. But from some angle, you're going to be able to see it. <laughs> but it's always there. It's just the way God set it up. God said, this is my token. I'm, this is what you can look at and you can understand that I made a promise that I'll never flood the earth again with, uh, with water and destroy all mankind and all living creatures. This isn't the first place where God mentions a, a covenant. Go back to Genesis chapter 6. God did make a covenant earlier and it's, it, this, this one is usually uh, passed over. When people write about covenants, they just don't mention this or just make, make a quick mention of it, and that's all. But this is, this is the covenant that God made with Noah before the flood. Look at verse number 18. He's talking to Noah. He says, But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, 
thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee, and they will be saved. So the covenant was, I promise. God's covenant with Noah before the rainbow, I promise that I will save you if you will come into the ark that you build. You will be rescued and saved from this flood that's going to destroy all mankind. And that was a promise that God made. And that's what, when God makes a, a covenant with mankind, it's a promise that he is going to fulfill because he is not a liar. He does not lie. The Noahic covenant. There's also what we call the Abrahamic covenant. Go over to Genesis chapter 12. And this is what we, what uh, Peter was um, referring to when he preached that message that we read in uh, Acts chapter 3. Genesis chapter 12, God speaks to Abraham. And verse number 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Now that, that this is a great thing for Abraham. He's going to have family, and, and he's, his name is going to be great. People are going to look up to him, respect him. But look at the next verse. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And I think we, most of us know what he's talking about here when God said that. Uh, in thee shall all uh, nations of the earth be, be blessed. And that comes from the descendant of Abraham, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Um, when he says, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curse thee, that is still valid today. And it's not talking about Abraham himself. It's talking about Abraham's descendants. <coughs> and as people curse the nation of Israel, or they bless the nation of Israel, God either curses those people or blesses those people. See, Israel, even today, is still made up of God's chosen people. As far as the Jewish nation goes, we are God's chosen people also as Christians. But we are not part of that nation. We are spiritual Israel at the whole Another whole uh, uh, sermon and message about that, but uh, today we're looking at the, the covenant that God made with Abraham, that in all, uh, all nations shall be um, blessed through Abraham and his descendants. That's the Abrahamic covenant. So we saw the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. Then there's a Davidic covenant, the covenant that God made with David, King David. Go over to... Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Now, I don't know if, if by this time you're wondering, okay, so we God made all these covenants, what, so what difference does it make? I'm going to get to it. Okay, 2 Samuel chapter 7, and look at verse number 12. So God's speaking to David here. It says, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, that means when he dies, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So he's talking about Solomon, because we know Solomon built the temple. So he's saying I, he'll establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house, now he's talking to David, remember, and thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. You get that? You, you know, when you look at the Old Testament, you see um, the, the people of, of Israel, the, the northern kingdom, and the southern kingdom of Judah, you see eventually they're wiped out or taken away captive, and there's no more king in Judah. No more king in Israel. So how is this, this kingdom to be established? Uh, he says, Thy throne shall be established forever. Uh, I didn't read verse 16, I think. 
and thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. That's a promise to David saying that his descendants, a descendant, first of all Solomon, his son, will be king, but it will always be David's kingdom. It will always be a descendant of David who is king over Israel. There's no king in Israel today. They have a prime minister, but they don't have a king. Who is the rightful king? We know it's Jesus. And so this is a promise that Jesus will be the king. You see it brought to light in the New Testament. But the Davidic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, and the, even the Noahic covenant all have to do with God's promise to men. And looking forward, this whole story of Noah shows the story of redemption. God saving mankind through the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, Abraham, uh, his descendants, uh, a descendant will be uh, where all nations of the earth, all people of the earth will be blessed through a descendant of Abraham, which is the descendant of David who is going to be king, Jesus. And now we also have the Mosaic Covenant. This is the one that uh, as you uh, look at the book of Hebrews and it talks about the covenant of God, we're talking about the Mosaic Covenant. Go over to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus 19, look at verse number 5. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. So God tells the children of Israel that you are going to be a particular uh, um, special treasure. A peculiar treasure. Peter calls us a peculiar people. We are we belong to him. And that's what he's telling the Israelites. They are a special possession to him. And this covenant that he's talking about is all that God gave Moses. The law, the um, uh, all of the sacrificial uh, system that God established. And we look at that and we see that we call it now we call it the Old Covenant. And you notice in, in the New Testament, the word that is translated as covenant is also translated as testament. And so when we look at our Bibles, and this is why the Bibles has two sections, and they're called the Old Testament. You can also call it the Old Covenant and the New Testament or New Covenant. When Jesus established the Lord's Supper, he did. He, he took that, that cup of grape juice and he said, this uh, is the new covenant in my blood. In one, one book it says new covenant. In another book it says new testament. Same word. The new testament in my blood. It's the covenant that God made with man. But it's a new covenant instead of what is called the old covenant. The old covenant, eventually the Jewish people kind of rejected it. They just did things the way they wanted to, and that's what Jesus had to deal with all through his ministry with the Pharisees. They were not adhering to God's covenant the way he wanted them to. And so Jesus was bringing in the new covenant. Go over to the book of Jeremiah. All of these covenants that God had in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, our, our Old uh, uh, Testament, we're leading up to God's New Testament. It's the new covenant that God had planned before the foundation of the world. We know when you look at the book of Revelation, you see that uh, uh, Jesus or the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. See, God in God's mind, He said, all of this is pointing out what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do with my son Jesus to die in place of all mankind, to finally pay the full penalty that everyone should pay. 
man, when you think about all of this, thousands of years that have gone by and the thousands of years that people were trying to do what they needed to do, what they should have done for salvation, is all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus died. And what, what do we need to do for the salvation that God provided? Nothing, really, except what He's done. And do you, how, how hard is it for you to accept a gift from somebody? You have a birthday party and people give you gifts? Well, it's you're supposed to accept them, right? Mm -hmm. So you accept the gift. Well, that's what God has done in Jesus. It's offered to everybody. And so many people reject it. But it's so easy just to say, okay, I'll take it. I believe it. I accept it. That's the salvation that uh, God had planned before the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. And he makes gives all these pictures ahead of time. Jeremiah 31. Did I say 31 earlier? Okay. Now you have to find 31. Jeremiah 31, and then if you can, find verse 31. So in verse 31, it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Of course, he's talking about those people who believe, those people who accept the gift of God. He says, I, their, the law, he says, uh, I will put my law in their inward parts. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in. He gives us the understanding that we can understand what God has made and He done for us in Scripture. And so we, this is the new covenant that he's talking about. The perfect, perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The one who was sinless, who died to pay the penalty of sin. He didn't have to die for himself. He died for us. And that was God's new covenant. In the book of Hebrews, the writer to the Hebrews uh, really makes it clear. I'm going to just go a little bit. We look at... Uh, all of what he says, we have looked at it in the past, the book of Hebrews, about the Old Testament sacrificial system mm -hmm. and how it's all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 8. We'll look at Hebrews 8 and 9 just for a, a little while. Verse number 8. It says, For finding fault with them, now this is the, the, the first covenant or the old covenant, uh, well, let, go back to verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. So when we say faultless, when God establishes something, it's perfect, right? So what, what does he mean by faultless? Uh, if, it, if it had been faultless, meaning there were faults in it. Not that God made mistakes, but God did, just did not make the way of salvation in those uh, rituals. It was all there to be used as a picture of what Jesus was going to do. And so the covenant that he made with man at that time was do this because later on this is what Christ is going to do. I want you to know how basically how good I am to you by what you do. So he says if, if it had been fault, faultless, he wouldn't have made a second, but he did make a second covenant. He says for finding fault with them... He said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. That's what we just read in Jeremiah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel 
After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith, a new covenant, he hath made the first old. So that, the, the old covenant. He says, since I have, I'm making a new covenant, <coughs> the first one's an old covenant. Disregard that as far as a covenant that I made. Because the new one is even better. Okay, and that's what the whole book of Hebrews is about. Showing that Jesus is better than what God established in the Old Testament. Although it was perfect at that time, always pointing forward to Jesus Christ. Uh, go down to Hebrews chapter 9. And verse number 11. He says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered into once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he, Christ, is the mediator of the New Testament, of the New Covenant that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance so by the means of death so in the case of both covenants the old covenant and the new covenant in order for the old covenant to be valid to do what God told them they needed to do there needed to be a death and so God used the animals as the sacrifices. Mm -hmm. The animals were slain to show that I'm following what God said. God made a covenant with the Jewish people, and so they offered their sacrifices. The sacrifices were used so that God would look at the sacrifice and see the heart of the people. The sacrifice was the mediator in a sense. And so when we come to the New Testament, the New Covenant... Jesus Christ is the sacrifice, and Jesus Christ is the, uh, the mediator of this new testament, this new covenant. Look at uh, verse number 16 here. He says, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testator is of force, or a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon, neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. If Jesus didn't die, there would be no last testament. There would be no inheritance for any of us. So God has established Jesus Christ as the mediator, as the sacrifice, as the testator, who would die so that we could have an inheritance. That's his covenant with man. I will do this. All you have to do is accept it. All you have to do, all people have to do is receive the gift of eternal life that God has done through Jesus Christ our mediator. The Bible tells us there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. <coughs> Let's go on here. Look at verse 19. For when Moses has spoken every precept to all the people, according to the law, we're looking at this old covenant, the Old Testament, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. What is the book? The book is the book of the covenant. What God wrote down, this is what I want you to do. Saying, this is the blood of the testament or covenant which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. 
and almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And listen, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. If Jesus had not died, if Jesus had not shed his blood, there would be no forgiveness of sin. Because the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. And Jesus had to die, and he had to bleed. Jesus Christ, in his death, reconciling men to God. A mediator is one that interposes between parties who are at odds or at variance between one another, and he reconciles them together. Jesus the mediator, Jesus the sacrifice, Jesus whose blood is that of the New Testament. God's new covenant. Jesus' work on the cross, what He did on the cross or dying, is a full payment for our sin. Mm -hmm. he, he was perfect sacrifice, not like the blood of bulls and of goats or lambs. His blood was free from sin. And so it was able to pay for all of our sin. So the sacrificial animals in the Old Covenant were all a picture of the sacrificial Son of God of the New Covenant. The covenant that God makes with men through Jesus Christ. Go over to Galatians chapter 3 and we'll close here. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? Or why did God have the law? It was added because of transgressions. It was added so the people could see that they were sinners. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels or messengers in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. God's covenant with man is so complicated from God's standpoint. But for our standpoint, it's just so easy. Believe. It's a sad thing that people just don't see it. Believe that God has paid your penalty of sin. People say, I'm not a sinner. I haven't done this. I haven't done that. You, you know, <coughs> just by saying you're not a sinner is a sin. You've just lied about it. They just, they just don't know it. So in their blindness, they reject faith in Jesus Christ. That's all it takes to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says, and thou shalt be saved. Mm -hmm. To all who believe, no matter what men may think for themselves, and what they think about themselves and about mankind, God has set the rules. And God's rules must be adhered to. So that whoever does, they must adhere to His rules. And that rule is believe. Now you are a sinner. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will be obeying God's rule and you'll have eternal life. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him, whosoever means anybody, whoever believes in Him, shall not perish but have everlasting life. God's covenant with man, the new covenant, Jesus Christ's blood paid for all of our sins. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your covenants. Lord, so many pictures that you have shown us to lead us to the truth of Jesus Christ being the final sacrifice, the final and only necessary sacrifice to pay the penalty of our sin. Thank you for the covenants. Thank you for the new covenant. The new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.